Secret Productions, right? A company, you never heard of Secret Productions? Yeah. Well, Secret Productions, you can hire Secret Productions. They do bar mitzvahs, weddings, <laughs> sweet 16 parties, yeah, uh, pizzeriettas, um, <laughs> you name it, they do it. First, first uh, one year old parties, whatever you need, okay? So they are for hire. It's a, it's a large uh, production company out of. Uh, they have a Parsippany out too, right, Dave? Out of Parsippany, New Jersey. All right. That's you see That's fine. We worked with them before. All right. So um, we will have a Q and A after the video. Okay. So please be quiet and understand. Uh, that other people want to see it. If you have a happy conversation, please leave the room. I will douse the lights so it'll be getting dark. And uh, uh, actually, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How are we to say people? Well, no, I wanted to say something first. There are actually three separate videos, and it'll take me a few seconds to switch from one to the other. So there's always a chance. Barely. All right. Right. We can do it. Actually, it's film reels. Steady with his hands. Richard, the lights are. It's okay. It's good. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So Richard, uh, put the lights back on that people will be able to see on the video so the broadcast and everything. Looks right. like Mystery Science Theater. I always see the head over the white screen. <laughs> <laughs> so make it fun. You can't see it again. Where? Where? And look, a dog. You guys are broke. <laughs> That's us. That's so true. Well, actually, before we get into showing these videos, I thought I'd uh, just throw in a little. Uh, so it's more uh, than a few words. A little history, yeah, a little history. So we're going to talk about some more reasons, more reasons to visit InfoAge, <laughs> some of the new features that we're uh, in incorporating there. Uh, now, uh, you know, a little background, InfoAge is built where Camp Evans was. Uh, Camp Evans was closed uh, almost 30 years ago. Uh, well, okay, 21. Uh, and it is, in fact, the National Historic Landmark and the World War II, and the World War II uh, uh, Living Memorial. Now, we, NJARC, uh, and other member organizations have been there since the early 2000s, in fact, since before I was in the club. Um, but our museum, NJARC's museum, uh, the Radio Technology Museum and other parts that we have uh, is really one of the prime attractions at InfoAge. So, what, where is this museum? Well, let's take a look. Back in the beginning, around the year 2000, that's what it looked like. The bottom picture. Remember building 9032, remember that number. What does it look like now? Well, it looks more like this. Much better, nice signs, and so on. And back at that time, of course, we had um, the Marconi Cottage was the first museum that, that NJR built. There's the Marconi Cottage, and here are some people, one of whom you might recognize. Um, we're working. <laughs> we're working in that in there, making it a actually a rather nice museum, but a small one. Uh, there's some of uh, what we had in there. But meanwhile, back in 1932, remember that number, here's what it looked like. Boarded up windows, uh, some people looking at some of the equipment on the floor, bad floors, um, um, a person you might know looking over the property and shaking his head. Uh, so the prep work did continue. There's somebody you also might know on the left uh, inspecting some of the equipment that later would, was demonstrated and it's shown. Uh, here are a few of uh, folks. Um, I think I see one up in the truck who donated the speaker today uh, moving some cabinets. This is generally what it looked like, getting a lot better. Why? Well, there was an, actually an official opening in 2006. We actually had been open before that, but uh, there was an official opening, a so-called Info Age Day in 2006, for which we got a plaque, and here's what the museum then looked like inside. Um, and here are some views of what it looks like today inside. Uh, you can see we have considerable set of displays with much uh, greater uh, history behind it and, 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 and frankly too much for the space we have, but we have the space we have. Um, and JR also has other museums at InfoAge, which you, some of you probably know about and some don't. Uh, there's the Radio History Museum, which is a Radar History Museum, which is in the Marconi Building. Uh, and there's a military communications museum, also known as Al's Museum, uh, just down the hall from uh, the main RTM Radio Technology Museum. Um, and finally, we'll get to what we're going to talk, uh, we're going to see about today, some of the new features of the museum. Uh, the NJARC Repair Shop, uh, sign being over there. Uh, which will be described by Mark Bieferman, virtually. The World War II living room work, which I'll describe. 
uh, there's a sign here. Uh, both of those are, are very near uh, the, the World War II Communications Museum. And finally, the audio gallery, which is going to be in the main museum, and uh, Al Place is going to be describing uh, what uh, is, is there and is going to be there. Um, and this is, of course, all going to be presented through the magic of the video recordings that Dave Sika has kindly prepared for us. That's Sika Productions. Sika Productions, right. And here's where I have to change the reel. Change the reel. It will take me a minute or five or something like that. Sorry, it's new. <laughs> beep. 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 Okay. beep. One moment. A while back, Ray Chase asked me if I would be willing to take the lead in developing a repair shop for the club's radio technology museum. We had a small repair area in the corner of the office area of the museum but it was tiny and cramped. And although it was better than nothing, it was not really adequate for the type of work we needed to do. When the opportunity came up to acquire a bit more space for the museum, we jumped on it with the idea of creating a nice repair shop. The room was originally part of the Vintage Computer Museum. When that museum moved their display to a different location a few months ago, we were given the space which is adjacent to our existing museum space. Creating a repair shop here would serve three purposes. First, it would serve as a more efficient workplace for always ongoing repair work on museum radios. Second, it would serve as an auxiliary display to allow visitors to see what a radio repair shop looked like. And finally, it would allow members to work on their personal projects in a nice, well-equipped environment. The existing carpet was in good shape, but otherwise the room was in virtually unrestored condition. Thanks primarily to Steve Rosenfeld, who took the lead, we have new windows, new car, and new glass, and new shades were provided by one of our members. The whole room was repainted, thanks to Don Irish, Jules Palacio, Tom Sedigren, Bruce Ingraham and myself, and it certainly looks a lot nicer in here now. We ended up with room for three workbenches. Thanks to our place, each bench has a basic complement of service equipment, a signal generator, a signal tracer, oscilloscope, power supply, frequency counter, along with a soldering station and assortment of the common hand tools like cutters, pliers, wrenches, screwdrivers, and so on. Thanks to Ben Juarez, electrical outlet grounding problems were corrected. Each of the workbenches is equipped with multiple ground full circuits. Jules and Harry Clancer made sure there was enough electrical outlets for anything we might need to do. There's an indicator to show when each circuit is on or off. It's well lighted, and there are plenty of electrical outlets. We've always had plenty of parts, but they were scattered around, stored in different places. Now, they're all in here and all organized on shelves and in drawers. We also took all the test equipment and tools that were in the other room and added some more to fully outfit each of the benches. Small tools, along with hardware and restoration supplies, are stored in the drawers, and the drawers are labeled so it's relatively easy to find what you need. Besides basic hand tools, we have specialized tools such as meters, alignment toolkits, and supplies such as crimp terminals, steel wool, and all kinds of chemicals. Oils, cleaning spray, hookup wire, heat shrink tubing, audio connectors, plus chemicals like Loctite, Novus, and things like that. We have line cords, semiconductors, fuses, lamps, basically everything you need to restore the average radio. 
The drawers are all numbered, and there's a drawer location guide. So if you're looking for something, say uh, drill bits, you can look it up in the guide and see right away that they're in drawer 31. So you don't have to go through every drawer looking for whatever it is that you need. We keep heavier duty tools like hammers and power tools over here in these toolboxes. We have an inventory of tested tubes stored in cabinets like this. And our really valuable tubes are stored in a lock cabinet over here. We also have a nice Hickok tube tester along with tube manuals. We even decorated the place a bit. Here's a TV radio service sign. And over there, I put up a vacuum tube advertising clock. I come in about every week or so and continue to sort things out. We have a lot of parts that still need to be sorted. And there are a lot of items that have shown up over the years that just need to be thrown away. It's still a work in progress, but the shop has been functional for about six months now. A lot of people work in here at different times, so we've established some policies and procedures to help keep things running smoothly. Basically, the idea is to keep the benches clean, so when the next person comes in, they have a nice place to work. The projects are stored in bins on these shelves while they are in progress. There's a chart on each one that says what the project is, who's responsible for it, and what the status is. For example, here's one. Rick Cordasio is working on an RCA 310A television. I'm working on a Philco clock radio. Once I'm done for the day, I'll put everything back in the tub and put it on one of these shelves so it'll be out of the way. And anybody else who wants to use the space will be able to do that. That's really the most important thing. Come in and do your work. Then clean up when you're done. Leave a clean space so that the next person doesn't have to come in and clean up your mess before they can start. People have been pretty good about this so far. If you're working on museum items, such as this Filco, the course of any parts you use are covered by the club. When space is available, the shop can be used by club members for working on their own projects. In that case, you're responsible for paying for whatever parts you use. We ask that you throw in a little extra beyond just the cost of the parts that you use, such as capacitors, since the money in the parts funds helps us not only replace parts you use, but also to purchase consumable supplies, such as cleaners and polishes that we always need. We also accept donations of parts and test equipment. So if you have anything at home that's surplus to your needs, let me know and perhaps we can use it in a museum repair shop. So if you haven't seen it in person yet, come check out the New Jersey Antique Radio Club's new antique radio repair shop. Volunteer to work on a museum repair project or get one of your own radios going in our new, clean, efficient workspace. Hello from InfoAge. We're located at Historic Camp Evans. Camp Evans is a National Historic Landmark and the World War II Living Memorial for the State of New Jersey. The New Jersey Antique Radio Club has been working with the Association of Old Crows and other InfoAge member organizations to recreate a World War II living room. Why? The center of many homes was the radio. In particular, the news, the speeches, programs, and the music that the radio brought into the wartime home. Welcome to my living room. Here's a typical radio. A console radio that likely was in a living room during the war. The question we had was, how to bring all these things that I mentioned, news, music, and so on, together in a way that visitors could really experience? Well, like many other things today, we did it with a computer, one called a Raspberry Pi, which is in this box. 
In a minute, I'll show you how it works, but first, I'd better mention that what you will see is based on software called Pi Presents by a gentleman from the UK named Ken Thompson. He created the software for the specific purpose of operating museum displays. He's associated with the Museum of Technology in Spalding, Lincolnshire, England. I will admit that I had to write some software myself to create what you will see, but these were just little add-ons to his amazing work. Without his Pi Presents, creating this would have been impossible. This is the screen the visitor sees walking into the room and sitting down. So, we can start. And we're welcome to the 1940s. Now the visitor can select the year. Let's say that we select 1944. We can choose from various kinds of material. Let's say that we want to listen to the news. Um, here's a D-Day broadcast from CBS News on June 6, 1944. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. This ends the reading of Community Number 1 from Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force. Now, suppose we want to listen to some music from the year 1944. We select music. And suppose that we want to listen to the way it is in Berlin in 1944, late 1944. There'll be a hot time in the town of Berlin when the Yanks go marching in. I want to be there for a 1944 was, of course, a very sentimental year at home. So let's listen to some sentimental music from that time. Now, there was a lot happening in 1944. Uh, and uh, let's listen to some of the speeches that were given at that time. Here's General Dwight D. Eisenhower's address to the D-Day uh, soldiers before they went in. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. So you can see, you can select a lot of material from that year. And in fact, from any year during the U.S.'s involvement in the war. Here's something that everyone knows. From 1941. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. Of course, there was a lot of other material on as well, things that kept people uh, at home entertained, and maybe you heard some of this program. And of course, there was something that everyone knows. A pile of dust and a 
Ohio Silver, the Lone Ranger. Now, those two weren't the only kinds of material on the radio, and we've got it. We've got some. Uh, here is something that people here might be interested in. Now, Admiral is at work producing something else to make life better. Radar, the same radar that is performing miracles for our fighting men on every battlefront of the world. Radar's ability to locate enemy planes and ships despite darkness, fog, or storms is daily bringing victory nearer. And after victory is finally won, radar will bring about changes in commercial aviation comparable to the changes radio brought in circulating news. Planes will land at night on fog cloak fields in perfect safety because of radar's on... So you see, we've tried to bring a little of everything uh, during the entire war to the visitor to this room. Uh, most of the people who visit weren't there, but we tried to recreate what it must have felt like. So that's the end of our program, but perhaps um, you'd like to visit the museum and create your own program by listening to some of this material. Thank you. Part of the revised uh, audio section of. I said pause. <coughs> oh, sorry. Anyway, you saw the block diagram. What we want to do is set up sort of what you had at a classic hi fi store where you have speakers on display and buttons to select them and other buttons to select program material. And uh, so we're doing that by hand in this presentation. Go ahead. And maybe another place for Pi Presents on another Raspberry Pi. We'll have to see how this works out. Here's a Raspberry Pi, by the way. Okay. <laughs> As part of the revised uh, audio section of the Radio Technology Museum, we thought it would be important to take a look at transducer technology. Now, a transducer is the part that makes the electrical audio frequency energy into sound that you can hear. And of course, this all starts with the telephone, uh, well before radio. And magnets in here move a diaphragm, and sure enough, you can hear things. Now, uh, of course, telephone operators needed to do this, and they didn't have enough hands. This leads to the invention of the head telephone or headset. And this gets used in early radio, and, but you want to have more than one person to listen, listen to this. I mean, two people can go this way, uh, but that really doesn't solve the problem. So horns of this sort were invented. You can put your headset down here, and like so. And voila, you have a loud speaking telephone. Not real efficient, not real good sounding, but better than better than a headset. So the next step in our journey here is the formalized horn speaker. You have a headphone element in the base here. 
talks into the horn. The horn does an acoustic transformation from high pressure down here to low pressure over a large area over here, thus projecting a sound out in the air where you can hear it. And we'll play this one. Now, the main shortcoming in all of these horns is lack of low frequency response. And also because of the uh, headphone element, you can't drive these very loud until, until they distort. So that's your basic horn speaker. We all, we've seen them all on the radios, uh, et cetera. That got us on into the 1920s. Okay, and the next piece of equipment we're gonna take a look at is this horn. Now, we have a gentleman named Peter Jensen, a Swede. He worked for Vladimir Polson on the Polson Arc radio transmitters and found himself in California working on the transmitters for the Federal Telegraph Company back in the teens. And he gets involved in audio, in particular sound reinforcement, public address. And so he takes a look at these loudspeaking telephones and he develops a better one. Instead of a magnet pulling on a diaphragm, he has a metal diaphragm in here with a voice coil on it like a modern speaker. And one of the shortcomings of the headphone drivers is that the magnet technology was not very good, the permanent magnet technology. So Jensen installs a big electromagnet to provide the field for this speaker. You run it off the A battery in your radio, it pulls about a half an amp at six volts. And so now we've got a strong magnet, we've got a real diaphragm with a voice coil, and it's capable of being pretty loud. Jensen's original company and original trademark was Magnavox. So that's a good loud horn speaker. You still don't have any low frequency response to speak of. Meanwhile, back at the telephone company, uh, they're working away on talking pictures, public address, making their telephones loud so people can hear them. And they take the next step and develop the paper cone loudspeaker. And so you have a big paper cone here. Inside you have a horseshoe magnet with a device called a balanced armature driver. Armature moves this way and a push rod comes out and moves the speaker. The primary advantage here is that because you have a much larger speaker, a much larger cone, you can reproduce lower frequencies and get better reproduction of sound and music. Paper cone speakers are fragile. Your kids or your pets could tear them up pretty, pretty readily. So what really happens is devices like this RCA speaker, cone, metal frame to protect it, and still a balanced armature driver with a horseshoe magnet back here to move it. Uh, a lot of these were built. Uh, those RCA speakers you see in the little boxes 
are of this sort, I think it's RCA type 100, you're still crippled by the fact that the magnets really aren't strong enough. Okay, the next stop in our journey to audio excellence here is the RCA Model 104 loudspeaker. Uh, this was developed about 1925 uh, by a pair of General Electric engineers named Rice and Kellogg. I don't think it has anything to do with Rice Krispies. So, up in front here, you have a paper cone in a metal frame, much like the Model 100, except this time the cone has a voice coil on it, much the way the, much the, way the Magnavox did, and the magnet structure is an electromagnet, much like the Magnavox. So you have the advantage of high efficiency and high output, plus the better low frequency response of the paper cone. Uh, because you need to power the magnet, and because you needed some amplifier power to do this, this thing contains a Type 10 amplifier tube, a couple of rectifiers and a voltage regulator, and would also serve as an AB, an AB battery eliminator for uh, some of the radiola radios. But uh, we'll turn this around and we'll, we'll play it for you. <laughs> okay, so this is the electrodynamic loudspeaker, like you find in all the 1930s radios, big field coil that's part of the power supply and a large cone speaker that sounds pretty good and we'll play this guy. So, again, the phone company comes into the picture. They're working away on talking pictures, uh, sound for the movies. And what they come up with is two-way speaker systems, the woofer and the tweeter. And their tweeters are horns. The so-called multi-sectoral horn that you see has multiple openings to it. And they get involved with James B. Lansing, who established a company called Alltech, short for All Technologies, and he manufactures equipment essentially designed by the phone company. And in 1944, he introduces the Alltech duplex speaker. This is a 15-inch speaker, and in the middle of the speaker, right back to the voice coil and everything, there is a multiceptral horn that does the high frequencies. Uh, this device is genuinely high fidelity. Uh, in fact, they get used for studio monitors and recording studios for many years thereafter. Uh, this one happens to be co cobbled into a Jensen speaker cabinet, and we'll play the thing. <laughs> One second to cut over to some material that's not an acoustic recording. <laughs> participate in the museum. Uh, we can use you as well. Yes. Harry, just a quick question about the World War II living room. Yes. When you're, you're queuing things up on the Raspberry Pi, does mm -hmm. it play it through the Raspberry Pi console, or is it actually playing it? No, it's playing it on the, on the radio. That actually, just the speaker radio. Okay, so we, we kind of did a digital I've got an, an 
Inside that box, there's a Raspberry Pi like this. There's a, um, a power strip and an, a little amplifier. Gotcha. And it's connected to the, to the speaker and actually plays through the radio. Cool. Right. So it's playing through the real radio. It's not just the speaker in the cabinet? Yeah. Well, speaker. it's, no, the radio's in there too, but. It's just not. Uh, let, 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 me tell, let, let me tell you a little secret. That radio is a piece of junk. <laughs> 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 it's got a power transformer that's about like an half an inch thick. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's got six tubes or something like that. It's, it's, the speaker's pretty good, but that's his rate, actually. Uh, Ray Chase actually donated the speaker. Harry, can you just quickly talk about the Raspberry Pi? A lot um, of people don't know the, the history of it. Well, it's... <laughs> uh, let's see, do people know Linux? Uh, but Linux, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a small computer, very very high power. Um, everything yeah. it doesn't have any memory. Everything's not on a micro SD chip. Um, basically, we, we use these down in the museum. Yeah, for, tell them how much it costs. Oh, it's about 35 bucks. Uh, and then, you know, this is 10. Um, eBay, you can get it anywhere. I, 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 Got most of mine from. I've got a, like half a dozen. I've got them mostly from um, um, Amazon. You know, um, there are different companies that sell. I mean, Raspberry Pi itself is is, is a British thing, but um, there are different companies that sell them. They sell the cases. They sell everything else. Uh, there, there are tons of software out there for the basic machine. Um, you just download it and, and uh, you know add your own software on top of it. It's a, uh, the one that we use in the in Al's um, military communications room to drive the teletype uh, actually uses three different three different languages. <laughs> it uses Perl and uses uh, uh, Python, which are two very common languages, and uh, uh, so on. So you know, it does simple things, it does complicated things. It's uh, the, the new one, the Raspberry Pi three, uh, is is you know it's pretty powerful. Much smaller than the 40s model you have in the video. Because it's like <laughs> a whole smaller. other death. Well, but in that box, you know, I have one of these. I know. This, how this many, is what how many tubes are you doing one that's in that box? <laughs> well, see, you know, I always give that story about uh, cell phones to people when I show them uh, in, in the museum. About uh, I show them a cell phone and I show them, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 IC, the, the ICs and uh, point out that there are like hundreds of thousands of tube equivalents inside one of the ICs. <laughs> right. <laughs> this, this basically has two chips. It's got a, a video chip and it's got a uh, processor chip. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's hard to explain, but if, if you know computing languages, any computing languages at all, and, and you know a little bit about operating systems, uh, this runs in Linux. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to use, um, and it will do many, many things. I mean, obviously, it's not, uh, not a high-powered machine, but uh, it does many, many things. Um, on that particular thing, I think I have something like 300 um, audio pieces up to an hour long each, um, and, uh, you know, it all fits on it. How much memory is on that SD card, Harry? Uh, this one is 32, I think. And this one's wow. impressive. That's all. No, this one's 16. This one's 16 gigs. 16 gigs. Sorry. Uh, but uh, you can get uh, 64s. You can get 128s. Yeah. Uh, um, I have yet to load up a 16 fully. I've been doing this for a long time. So. Uh, you got a question? Very powerful. Does the uh, InfoAge facility, is that owned and operated by NBA or RC? Or no. Is that, the or you just have space there where you have the uh, we have We have space there. We're one of the member organizations. There are about 10 members, uh, member organizations, uh, including, I mentioned the Association of Old Crows, which is a military, uh, old military group. Uh, there's a computer group, there's NJARC. We, we have by far, 
don't brag too much, but the, the, best, the best museum there. And, and we're one of the biggest drawers. Um, and, uh, but no, it's, it's owned by the town of Wall. Uh, it's, it's intended to be a uh, learning uh, and, and, uh, and uh, technology center. Uh, and uh, we both have museums, various museums, including the Computer Museum, the Arms Museum, and so on. And we also do uh, talks, and we have kids in sometimes for training with this. Uh, we had an IEEE engineering group and kids um, last spring, and so on. So, so we're both a learning center and a history center. And, and, and NJR is part of it. As, as I said, we are one of the, the main contributors. Yes? Did you do all the development work yourself on the, on the bike? Well, as I said, the uh, high presents is right. <laughs> really what makes it work. But yeah, I, yeah, sure. And the other, the other add-on stuff you did all that. I did all the add-on stuff and all exactly. the. You know, nice job. Sure. I mean, it's it's, it's it's takes time, but it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Uh, as I said, the more the more familiar you are with computers and computer languages, it becomes easier. It can it can be done. I, I might add the uh, the touch screen display was one of the most, I would think, one of the most difficult parts, and it really makes the whole thing, because the touch screen display looks like the front of the radio, and you're just touching the radio on the screen to get whatever you want. Originally, when we started this, Ray wanted us to build a mechanical, build it on a radio, basically, have you select by pushing the buttons, and I said, ah, oh, you know, contacts go bad, so on and so forth, <coughs> computers are on. You can tell which era I'm from. And <laughs> <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't have enough contact cleaner to keep, one, to keep a mechanical machine going. Anyway. Uh, sure. So is the room actually up and running? You've had the room is up. The, there our part what, of the room what's the user experience it. like? Because it we, strikes me that an armchair with a touch screen is pretty much a single user experience. Uh, no, Maybe there, there are two chairs. We wanted a sofa, but we never got one, so we'll put a sofa okay. in there sometime. Uh, and um, we've had a constant flow of visitors who like listening to the whole thing. What started that whole thing was that for a number of years, people have been coming to the museum saying, can we listen to some of this old music and old programming and so on? And uh, we said, yeah, well, maybe we can set up a place. And then the World War II people and the Association of Old Crows had this room, and uh, we just got together and said, okay, we'll do it from the wartime. And that's what we did. We, are, we could also do the same thing for the Golden Age of Radio or, or whatever. Uh, is, that <laughs> your, is that your plan to well, pop it out and, like, do different themes like well, that, that, that's that's pretty easy. But where are we going to physically do it? You know, we don't have a place to do it. Well, I just meant rerunning the software. Oh yeah, the software. You know, just jump in another disc and now it's you golden know, age. Well, you just put in different right. music, different selectors, and different right. selectors. The touch screen uh, kiosk or mini kiosk, if you will. It's a nice, uh, extensible kind of uh, very idea for very. other parts of the museum. Oh sure. Yeah. Um, have, you don't have to wrap a living room around it. No, 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 no. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's got a lot of possibilities. We just need to do it. Uh, let me just add, Harry, on that subject about kiosks, yeah. the Vintage Computer Federation, museum off the other side, yeah. uh, Evan Koblenz has been working with cheap uh, iPads. Oh, I know. Evan, so. In fact, Evan looked at our stuff and said, hmm, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> he's a man of very little words on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Incidentally, the, uh, I, I'm associated with the Capitol Radio Television Museum in Bowie, Maryland. And uh, I saw a display they had, which they spent about $1,000 on a chip, uh, and they have push buttons that can key up about five programs. And I thought we should have something like that. And uh, of course, our geniuses went, you know, a thousand times better. And we have a touch screen and all those hundreds of programs that you can select for whatever you want. So we're 
we were much better. <laughs> when a road is totally flexible, we could put in basically any, uh, you know, any amount, well, reasonable. <laughs> and, um, you know, any, any years, any type. Um, but, you know, you saw three videos. Uh, you, you saw the shop, and that is up and running and is Paul can tell you, he's, he's there working all the time. In fact, I missed a couple well. weeks, but I've well, been there for running, several running very well, right? Several months, yeah. And it's a very, very useful place, and, and we're no longer in that cramped space we used to be in, in the back of the museum where the junk was all piled up to the ceiling. Yeah. Uh, we actually have a place to work. Uh, we have this, and Al is, is working on the uh, audio, Al and, and Phil Wurtzis are working on the audio room, and the demonstration is, you know, you heard in the background a lot of kids in the next room doing things and, 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 and distortion when we drove the speaker too hard. You've got to be there for the real thing. And that's going to be really good. Uh, and, and, and that's part of the whole audio room, which is going to include the jukeboxes and, the, uh, and you know, all, all the audio, uh, other, other audio things we have that Phil is working on. Kevin, uh, for example, uh, has, has finally you made also this mentioned in the audio portion uh, in the museum, all tech lancing, they used to make uh, audio systems and stereos, and then I know Jensen used to build speaker systems for stereo. I assume it's the same Jensen. Yeah, that was the, the same Jensen later on. Yeah. Right, so how is this? It is, it's, it's, uh, for all those? Know, in, in terms of schedules, if you want, uh, <coughs> the shop is furthest along. The, the living room has just got started a month ago or something like that. And, and Al is in the process of putting all of his, his things, Al and Phil, I should say, putting the audio things together. So, uh, you know, we're all in different stages, but. If one person sits in a chair in, in the room, <coughs> but the rest of the family stand there and they're all listening to it. Well, so it's, it's not we have two chairs, by the way. But someday we'll have a. Yeah. When the roads get going, people come and, and they stand and listen and watch. They enjoy it, whether they're sitting in the chair or not. Were those speakers are club artifacts or are they just brought in for that video? I mean, uh, with, yeah. with a couple of exceptions, it's all club stuff. Okay. The, uh, the RK with the headset is, uh, is more Arabs. Uh, the Wagner box is mine, but the club owns the rest of it. Any other questions? Thank you all. Thank you. The Harry's a little modest, too. We do realize, as Bill pointed out in his first question, that Harry wrote the program to do that now. And, um, and then physically put it all together. Uh, Harry, it's absolutely amazing what you did. It really is amazing. And I want, I want to give you a <laughs> is, is anybody a good cabinet maker to make that box look like a real cabinet instead of <laughs> something that I put together in my basement? I have a cabinet out of 1920. Well, it's got, it's it's got a whole screen and so on. Oh. Why not just, I mean, since you're complaining about what a cheap 6 tube radio was in that, why don't you just rip that out and mount no, 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 the no, no, it? No, 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 that's the radio. There's no space in the radio for this. For the that's bigger. Screen. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good size screen. And my fingers are too big to hit the little dots, so it's got to hit the big dots. Sorry, I would just kill them. All right. Um, let me remind you that we are here for the August meeting, right? And it'll be Alan Wolke who will be giving us a wonderful presentation. Uh, Alan, as you know, or may not know, has given us many presentations. Thank you. And uh, he also gave us the famous Scopes for Dopes presentation. <laughs> and uh, we're leaving it up to him what pre presentation he will be giving us. Um, we did speak. And uh, I'm sure it'll be very interesting uh, along our lines of antique radio. Um, Alan also has become a honorary member of our club. Uh, I think it's only fitting that we do that. And he's, he's really a wonderful guy. If you've ever met him, 
you've seen many any swap meets or any um, ham fest, you know, please uh, approach him, talk to him. He's a great guy, a very smart fellow too. So we do appreciate having him uh, as a club member and having him here uh, with us uh, next August. Uh, please uh, realize that uh, August, you will not see the balloons outside. Um, <laughs> you will memorize your way in here, please. Um, and uh, again, we do thank uh, Professor Mike for allowing us to uh, use this space, finding the space for us. Okay. Uh, whatever you took in here, any drinks, uh, edibles or something, please take them out. We want to, we, uh, to uh, be a good uh, tent, uh, especially here. Since we are on loan for the space, um, uh, we have a garbage can right out of the front. Um, thank you all for coming, and uh, we will see you at the swap meet. Okay, we will see you at the swap meet in one week. Again, you want to be part of it, you want to be vending, let me know as soon as possible so that we can fit you in on a nice spot. Thank you very much. Safe trip home. Thank you all.